All right, welcome everyone. Um, we're about four minutes into the one o'clock hour, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, additional folks will join in as we uh, kick off here. We have got a little bit of um, introduction to do, and then we'll jump into your questions. So, uh, welcome and thank all of you uh, for joining our panel discussion today. We are thrilled to have you and our panelists here for a conversation around the value of office space. We've noticed in our clients and in our own organizations the need to make fast decisions about our physical space while living in a state of ambiguity and daily changing of guidance. Everyone is trying to understand what the future might hold in order to make the right decisions for the future of the organization and employees. Decisions that are often costly and have significant impact on our office culture. We've invited our panelists today to help answer your questions around real estate design, implementation, and change management. Before we dive into those questions, I wanna invite you all into this conversation as thought partners. We want you to focus on the value of the future and value of physical space and, answer, and we wanna answer the questions that you have. Please use the chat function uh, to chat either to our um, meeting producer if you're having technical issues, Chris Dietz, or to our moderator, Megan Sims, who will go into a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, everyone's on mute for now so that our speakers uh, are the ones that come through um, so that we're answering questions. So I want to start by introducing our panelists and then we'll dive into a few questions that are top of mind. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. We'll start with Eric West. Sure. Hi, I'm Eric West, a principal at Westland and Schlager Realty Advisors, a Washington, D.C. based tenant advisory firm. Hello, I'm Randy Thomas, one of the principals here at Abbott. We're a fully integrated global project management firm working throughout the built environment. And I'm Roger Salas Soleil. I'm a partner with Shape. We're an interiors architecture firm that specializes in workplace strategy and workplace design across the country. And I'm Kelly Barlow with The Clearing. I'm a workplace change strategist that supports leaders and organizations experiencing a workplace change. Uh, we focus on the human element of the change, ensuring that the voice of the workforce and customer are elevated as part of the conversation and support communication and engagement strategies throughout the process. So we've gathered these specific industry expertise together because they all play a significant role in helping you achieve your workplace strategy. So these four pillars of, of your strategy will help you and your organization have the space that best supports you and both in the physical and virtual environment. So that's why we've brought these four critical expertise, having them together, whether it's about your current space or a new space that you're moving into, um, ensures that your future workspace is well planned, executed, and adapted by your workforce. So I'm gonna turn it over to Megan, our moderator, to start the conversation. Hi everyone. So we'll get started by answering a few questions that we received in advance, but we'd love to hear from you as well. So if you have questions that come up throughout the panel, please use the chat feature to submit those and we'll get to them as we can. Um, knowing that we only have about 50 minutes left together, we may not be able to get to all of your questions. However, the panel is committed to following up on relevant questions after the event. So let's get started. Um, so part of the reason we're all here and a top of mind question for all of us right now is around the purpose of our office or workspace. So Eric, I'd love to start with you. Um, what is our purpose in being in the physical workspace? Other than just getting back to some version of normal, what do you and the other speakers think is the real true advantage of working in the physical office? You know, that's something that we uh, in the brokerage business representing tenants have really been um, forced to think through over the last three months and think through very, very deeply. The fact is, We've talked to a lot of clients who at the beginning, let's say in late March and early April, thought that working remotely was a great idea and those attitudes have shifted. But if you really break this down, the reason for the office is for a 
an organization, a company, a nonprofit, whatever organization it is, to create value through innovation. And inside the office, working collaboratively, together, face to face, that's where the innovation occurs through the creativity of working together and these teams. So the definition of what we use the office space um, for going forward may be different than what we were doing even at the beginning of this year. Because now the office space, while always it was a hub to be together, the real reason for an office is to come together to collaborate, which sparks creativity, which yields innovation. Prior to this, a lot of the stuff was, it was a task farm. We would come, the space was about myself, I, and now it's much more about we. And I think that's the role of the office. I think just to add on to what Eric was saying, I think innovation is the key. And I think that there's a very important teaming component, obviously, that comes in uh, with the most innovative of companies. Um, what we're forgetting is sort of this human quality to the work, right? The idea that we need personal connection every day to be able to do the job that we do effectively. So I think that when you're talking about, you know, what the true purpose of the office space is, it is this aspect of bringing people together to innovate, to experiment, to create. You talk about an industry like Mar mine, which is, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're creative designers. Um, it's very difficult for us to do this through a screen. Uh, you know, we're communicating with our team constantly through a screen and there's not that ability um, to really have that quick impromptu conversations. Everything seems to be scheduled. Everything's a Zoom call one after the other. And so, you know, the creative process really sort of suffers. Um, so what we're looking for really is that opportunity to come back into the office in a new normal, no doubt, um, but be able to really kind of reinstate that aspect of team, of, of a social culture for the organization. And I also want to say, you know, recruiting and retention is really hard in this type of environment. Uh, and so when you think about office space, big purpose for office space is to bring in the best talent, bring them into your environment, show them what your, your social culture is all about. Um, and it's hard to do that when everything is done through, uh, through a Zoom call. And I'll just add to that, Roger, that um, really your space should support your mission. And the critical thing to ask is, what do you want the customer and employee experience to be in your space? Um, what is it doing to support their work, to support your mission? Um, you know, to Eric and Roger's point, there's a lot going on in this virtual environment that's being replicated of what we used to do. But what we can't see is the well-being of people, right? It's much harder to know someone's state of mind because you don't see them interacting with others. You don't see them walking around the office or run into them and hear about their day. So that social connection, that human connection is a little bit severed. It's not that we'll ever go back to a fully a physical environment, for many of us anyway, uh, but it's knowing that that's available and that some people, myself being one of them, get energy from that, from being around other people, getting new and different ideas, helping solve a problem that I'm experiencing. I can ask the question to the bullpen and just say, hey, I need help. Who Who's experienced this before and get other ideas? That sort of in the moment collaboration and groupthink isn't happening in this virtual environment. And yeah, and just to add a little bit to that, I mean, you know, I've been reading a ton of, you know, there's a lot of white papers, articles, surveys, and things like that that have been coming out. And a lot, what I see as being the sort of predominant theme for all these, um, uh, these types of things that have been put together is that a lot of people are struggling working from home. And so they need to be back in the office. I think a I was reading a survey the other day that said overwhelmingly a majority of staff find it's really hard to collaborate while at home. Um, and it's hard to stay up to date as far as what, you know, their teammates are doing. Their top reasons for wanting to return to the office were to socialize, to have that impromptu face-to-face -face conversations like you're mentioning, Kelly. Um, but, you know, more so even to be part of a community uh, and to feel like you belong within a, a larger organization. I also want to say it's what's really interesting is that prior to COVID, 
there was a lot of talk about remote working. All the clients that we were working with and and um, talking to, they many were talked about remote working, but when you really pushed, you know, and explored how that would operate, there was a bias against it. And what we've learned since um, since the work from home situation in March is remote working can work and so there's this trust that has been earned that folks can work from home and produce and 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 be accountable now the neat thing is the office design uh that was done last year was forward thinking it's really going forward the office design is not going to change that radically but what is changing is the trust in remote working and so when i say people are going to come in and use the office as a hub again to collaborate to create to be together um, it's the exciting thing is it's about the the training and the, the new way of working so that we can get people where if 50% of the staff is gonna work remote part-time and 50% at the office part-time, how do we make that as a, efficient and as effective as possible and where productivity could actually increase? And so there is that other component about workplace strategy and training and change management and with design and new, and the new layout standards with the training, um, it's gonna really help with um, not just the collaboration and the innovation, but also worker satisfaction. That's a big part that comes into it, as you say that, Eric, about the worker satisfaction. There's the whole side of empathy that comes into this and your health and well being of the staff. As we're at home, we're working, we're remote from our staff and we're remote from our other fellow uh, workforce, what we're finding is that persons are starting to get disconnected and persons we don't know, we're, if we were in the office, we would have known if somebody was having a challenge or somebody was having a struggle and we could have drawn near and we could have actually helped them through it. And that's what we're seeing is another major component. The office brings together that energy, but it also brings together a place where we can work through things in the social side and we can actually get through these challenging times but it's it's by drawing near to the staff and it's that real health and well-being of each person as an individual so agree and I, i'm wondering too about so it, it sounds like that there is going to be somewhat of a shift into a new normal um but in essence we we need that physical interaction with each other in the office space to be innovative and collaborative. Um, I'm gonna pivot to Kelly for a moment. Kelly, without a future uh, crystal ball, how do we plan long-term workspace without knowing what the future holds? Yeah, so I think the critical piece to hold is that moving forward, we're gonna have to plan for both virtual and physical space, right? There's gonna have to be two environments that we operate in and that it's, and trust our employees and workforce and customers to engage with us in the way that's gonna make them the most successful, right? So that may be, I have a day of meetings and I do that better in the office when I can be face to face with people or it may be that I have a day where I have a lot of heads down work to do and I'd prefer to be home where there's less distractions. That's, that's kind of the way that things are going to be trending. And so the other piece to think about is as we think about the future, there may be more cases of pandemic, severe weather, whatever it is that will allow people or, or need people to make this pivot to this maximum telework environment. So the biggest thing in terms of planning for your long-term physical space needs is really getting data to help inform that. So what are the stories? So what is the qualitative data out there about the way people use space or want to use space? So it's surveying your workforce, uh, conducting interviews with your leaders or, or employees, 
collecting stories about space or about the virtual environment and how the experience has been to help inform what the future of physical space needs to be. And it's also looking at your quantitative data, even going back to 2019 and looking that, at that as a base year, looking at your HR data, how often are people on vacation and not really in the office? If you track telework, how often is that happening? Um, your security or badging data, you can learn a lot about how, how often people are in the office. Um, you can also look at things like your visitor data or your space data if you have a reservation system or a way to um, book conference rooms or desks. That's another way to look at how often space is being used. Once we are back and operating in a physical environment, another key thing is actually doing a observation study, having someone come in and walk around the space every hour and count how many people are using what kinds of space. That can help you help leaders inform a decision about what the space needs to be. And the biggest thing is thinking about what are the key activities that need to be done within the space and designing towards that. Um, so it's really important to consider what the impact of moving to a reduced footprint or a fully virtual environment will have on things like your employees and culture. Not just looking at the bottom line, but really thinking about what is the impact going to be overall on morale, on the culture, on your ability to re retain and attract staff. I think that's going to be a really important tool uh, for organizations as they start assessing, uh, you know, sort of what the new normal might be. Um, it, it really is interesting to look at the data from just a year ago and start comparing it to what we see today. Um, we're working with a, a, an organization right now and we're doing a very similar type of exercise. And one of the interesting we, things we, we found from, from a survey was that, you know, about a year ago, 50% of the staff was in the office five days a week. Today, only 15% of the staff are planning to be in the office five days a week. So that immediately has impact on how we might start thinking about the design of office space. On the flip side though, as we started looking at it as sort of the greater of the week or the, the majority of the week, you know, a year ago, 92% of the staff said that they were gonna be in at least three days a week. Today, they're saying maybe 82% of the staff will be in three days a week. So you're not seeing a huge disparity there. It really is kind of what you were suggesting, Kelly. It's gonna be that hybrid type of work where somebody might pick a day a week that they work from home, or maybe it's a morning they're working from home, but then the afternoon they're gonna be in the office to collaborate and connect like Eric's talking about in this hub type of a setting. So, you know, the data that we collect, that we have as a basis is really strong, but the data that we'll be able to collect and help inform our designs over the next, um, you know, years, um, as we adjust this to normal is gonna be equally as important. Yeah. I the way I've been looking at it and thinking about it is the idea of the nine to five workplace is kind of thrown out. And it may be that people do heads down work in the morning at home and then come into the office for meetings around 10 and they're going to leave around four, four thirty, to do a few more maybe another hour of heads down work at home when they get around to it. And, and so the, the idea that, uh, again, everybody's collecting at the office at a certain period of time, that's obsolete at this point. And I think it's going to have an interesting impact on traffic patterns, um, the rush hour. I think Fridays are going to be very interesting days because I would think that about 90% of staff would be working from home on Fridays and Mondays may be the same way. Um, it's very interesting, Roger, you were talking about a survey work on occupancy rates. We did the same thing recently with a client and the, the perception of the client was high use. Everybody was supposed to be in the office every day. It turns out the, the occupancy use whether it's workstation or office, averaged 27 and a half percent of the week, people were actually at their desks. So even the idea, the concept of what you do and how you do it is very different from the reality when you start measuring it. And then you could, now that we have the trust about remote working and we kind of know how to do it, this will just take off and, and sort of become standard. 
Yeah, Eric, I would add to that, that um, we've done a few observation studies and we found the exact same thing. People who think that they're there nine to five and that means they're you know, at their desk and need this space, but when we actually look at how they're using this space, they're away from their desk 60% of the time. So what do you really need a palatial office for, right? Um, and we've seen success with clients who have embraced things like mobility to that you're mobile inside the building, but also externally, right? You take your laptop with you and you go to a meeting and you take notes, things of that nature. So I think that um, these really making sure you have the right data to help inform your decisions will be critical. And looking at what are the key activities, what are the critical activities that support your mission and help move you forward. Yeah, I think in many ways, sort of what we're all experiencing right now has, has been an accelerant, right? It's sort of accelerated the rate at which we start to think about uh, working from home, mobile, mobile working, uh, those types of things. And so, you know, when we talk about the direction that office design was going in over the last couple of years, you know, many concepts more open, more collaborative, more, um, you know, more, um, uh, more, more choice oriented as far as how you establish your own settings. I think this has accelerated it, right? Now we're, we're totally understanding this, you know, we're all been forced to work from home. And so it's, we've gotten the technology down. Uh, we know how to use it. Uh, so, you know, I think it's going to change even the framework of how we work within the day to Eric's point, you know, you don't know, you know, you're going to be, you're going to have a hybrid type of work day where you might work from home for a couple hours, run to the office, then go to a meeting, all these types of things. And so it's going to definitely change how we start to perceive and use the office space. I think it's, it's in some ways going to reinvent it, but in some other ways also realign it a, a bit more. That's great. Um, Roger, you were just talking about, you know, we have the technology down, you know, we're working from home, we're, we're operating as best we can. I'm wondering what place technology will have in the future of our office space of corporate real estate. Um, Randy, would you be able to kick us off in, in talking about that? Definitely. It's, I think it's a very interesting question. I think we need to answer it really in two parts. There's the part that is the actual office environment of what we are gonna be using technology for. And then there's also the other side, which is the technology that's being used now to actually develop, monitor and operate as we create the actual physical space that we're gonna be working in. Um, I'll start with the, the second part of it, but just as we're advancing in the whole design and managing of projects, it's important to get intelligent and accurate data like we've been talking about and to be collected and recorded throughout the whole project life cycle. There's multiple new softwares out there and new technology that are helping us do this throughout the whole environment. One of the ones that we're using a lot right now is Matterpart, and then there's a new one, Spot, which has just come out. And these will help us to manage, uh, monitor, and mitigate any of the risks that may affect the cost and schedule of you actually building out your space. Spot, that's a robotic dog that we're deploying now with photographs, and it can go through the whole and collect the data as it goes through a site robotically, and we don't actually even have to be there for it to do this. And it's now sending us the data that we can put into a digital twin, which incorporates with the whole Revit and BIM model software. This, it's all taking us to a very accelerated rate of technology coming in as, as we build out this space. And what it's allowing us to do is take, and with the right technologies, we're able to manage the project throughout this ever-changing world that we're living in we're also able to help you, put you in a place where you can monitor it and actually operate it functionally better in the future. Secondly, if we go over to the AV and software technologies that we're having come in, there's, they're emerging daily. And what we're having to do is go through them and review them. And although it's, um, it's critical for us to have the physical environment, these new technologies are helping us draw together those that are working remotely, but it also helps us draw together other physical offices 
and bring people together across the globe that we may not have been able to do in the past. We might have had to take a flight over to an office to actually join in with them. We're getting a lot more collaborative than just joining on to a Zoom call. Um, Roger, what do you have to say about some of the more technology side coming in with AV and this? Well, I, I think, you know, it obviously has a big impact on how we start thinking about office space as well. You know, I think one of the questions I, I've, I've been asked many times is like, hey, we want to have a full staff meeting, but I'm not comfortable having everybody in the same environment at one time. Yeah, that's a understandable concern. And I think it's not just now. I think it's a concern that people will have for the future. Hence, technology comes in, you know, the ability to pull people into staff meetings, board meetings and things like that via Zoom definitely uh, relieves the need to have very large conference spaces and things like that. So I think it, it can provide a solution for organizations to work around some of their space needs. You know, why have a large conference room for 30 people if you're going to have a staff meeting once a month? You know, do you really need that capacity? Can you reduce those capacities? So thinking about the functionality of technology and how it can allay some of the specific requirements of office space, I think is, uh, is critical. Yeah, I wanna, oh, okay. go ahead, Eric. I, I think I, I want to, I want to talk about two things with regard to that. Number one, what's very apparent is the, um, remote working software, um, is good, but as employers, if you're going to hire people that are going to be working remotely for a significant portion of the week, and significant to me would be 30% or more of the week, you're going to be working remotely. I think it's inherent upon the company then to provide each of the employees with the right set of tools, the work from home tools. So it, it, a laptop doesn't really help um, for those of us who work, for instance, with dual monitors. Um, and that could be on the creative side, it could be on the, the people that do a lot of analysis that require m multiple documents, that kind of thing. Um, and also great connectivity. Uh, Wi-Fi doesn't always work. Um, so that's on the, the technology side, but more from the work from home employees. With regard to gatherings, Roger's point is accurate, and what we're hearing, you know, again, why are you going to have a boardroom for you know 40 people when buildings provide large conference centers tenant only conference centers um, and so you can sort of see how these amenities that may not have been used before these building amenities may become in much more high demand and in fact buildings of the future may double the amount of common area um, gathering spots because we'll take it out of this space. Tenants aren't going to pay for it. They don't need that kind of space when it's a once a month gathering. So it has both sort of operational and organizational impact and also financial impact on both ends. Yep. And I would just add that when you're thinking about technology, it's really important to think about what you're trying to enable in your work, right? So whether that's in the physical space, do you need a reservation system? Do you need to help uh, your workforce work more mobily? How are you um, checking in and checking out visitors, customers, or reservable spa spaces? And how can you communicate with your workforce both phys in the physical space and in the virtual environment? One of the things that I've been talking to a lot of my clients about is what is the technology that you miss or what are the processes that you can't actually do now that you have to be at home? Things that people don't think about a lot like mail, right? How are people getting their mail since it's delivered to the physical office and someone might be there to receive it and sort it, but who's there to open it? Who's there to respond to things that need to be responded to? Um, things of that nature. So really having some critical conversations around what processes need to shift to or be enabled more by technology to be able to operate in a dual physical and virtual environment. Great, thank you everybody. So in thinking about that, that's you know how we shift moving forward or maybe start getting um, 
really pie in the sky around how we want the future workplace to look. We had a scenario come in that's really interesting. So my organization recently built out a forward thinking, collaborative and flexible space. Is our space now obsolete? Roger, um, can we start with you? Sure. Um, so it, 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 you know, that falls in line very much with what I keep hearing uh, and, and people are asking me is, okay, are we seeing the end of the open workspace? You know, uh, is that going away? These, these large collaborative areas, you know, this type of a trend. Um, and, and you know what, the way I look at it is no. Uh, you know, I think the business drivers and the social drivers that pushed organizations towards going to more innovative, more open, more collaborative types of environments, those are still there. Uh, you know, we still want to create collaborative type settings. We want to promote teaming and we want to be efficient at it as well. I, you know, so I don't see that changing. I don't see an environment where we now start going back to, uh, you know, encapsulating everybody in small offices and giving everybody their safe environment. Uh, you know, if, if everybody's going to, if people have the ability to work from home and find that focus and quiet time that they need at home, why then are they coming back to the office to then also, you know, sort of sequester themselves in a, in a private space? So I think the key thing there is I think, you know, open environments will definitely continue. I think we'll create a safer open environment, no doubt. I think we'll pay attention to the sizes of workspaces and things like that. Um, so I think that's still key. Uh, but I don't think that we're going to go in the opposite direction of creating sort of a super quiet type of environment. I think uh, Eric, uh, you know, sort of referenced the, the term sort of a hub space. I think that's going to be really the key that, you know, I'm going to work from home, but when I'm in the office, I'm connecting, I'm collaborating. So we're going to want more uh, meeting spaces and collaborative spaces. Now, these spaces may get bigger in some senses. In other words, I know we were we were going for a lot of efficiency. We were creating small team rooms and huddle areas for two and three people. Well, those functions might get a little bit bigger, uh, you know, to give people comfort as far as uh, social distancing and spacing. But we still may need uh, more of these types of functions. Um, and those types of functions also support the need for what a person might come into the office for. I do still think we'll have private offices and private spaces. But I think a lot of those are going to tend to be more sort of shared type spaces. So, you know, if I'm in the office Mondays and Wednesdays and my, uh, you know, my office uh, mate here is in the office Tuesdays and Thursdays, that works to a very equitable uh, method of, of sharing an office. And, of course, you're reducing the amount of square footage. The last thing you want is to have seas of, of enclosed spaces that go empty and vacant and unused throughout, throughout the day. That doesn't create a good atmosphere or a good culture for any organization. So, you know, what we're seeing, I think, is definitely a reinvention and a realignment of some of these things. I, I do see, and I'm working with clients right now to actually reduce the quantity of offices to create more flex spaces for people to be able to use. We're looking at increasing the percentage of circulation space so that we're not quite so tight. We need to give everybody elbow room. So, you know, we're looking about 50, you know, 10 to 15% more in circulation areas if necessary. Overall, you know, I think we are going to see a reduction in the typical size of office space. There's no doubt. I mean, if, if we can have a half or even two thirds of our workforce working from home on a given day, and we really only need to accommodate, say, a third to a half, then we're going to see some reduction in space. But I don't think we're going to see a 50% reduction in space. I think we might see a 15 or 20% reduction in space as we start to think about, um, the flexibility of, of office space overall. I think uh, Eric and I are working with a client right now where we, uh, you know, initially had programmed them to be about 12,000 square feet. And then we did this sort of, okay, post-COVID scenario for them. And we brought them down to about 10,000 square feet, you know? So again, about 20% is about right uh, for, for this organization. So just some things to keep in mind. Now, what happens to the foosball tables and coffee bars and ping pong tables? I, I fortunately think those things might might go because uh, nobody's going to come to the office to get a killer game of ping pong going. But um, I think that, you know, some of those functions will go away, but I think we'll still try to retain some of the social aspects of office space. And I think just to build on your points, Roger, I think um, really, in, I think the people that have that open, more flexible space are really in an advantage in this situation. 
they have the ability to pivot way more easily. Your staff are likely already outfitted with the tools and technology needed to work in a more mobile or virtual environment. But it also enables people to choose where they're going to be most successful. And I think that's really the key in this new environment that we're in or next phase of office space that we're entering is really allowing your workforce to choose what's right for them. Is it to stay home and get work done because maybe you're going to get a lot more, be much more productive than you would be in the office when, when people keep stopping by to ask how your weekend was or what's going on next tomorrow. Um, and it's also one of those pieces is that you need to really consider what are the activities that are critical to get done. So the idea of activity-based spaces. So um, I know Roger named a lot of them, but what is it that people are coming to the office to do and providing them the space for that? And thinking about a person who may come in for a morning of meetings, they may want to stay there and get their heads down work done. So is there a small space or a quiet car that where people can go if they need to get like an hour of work done between meetings or at the end of the day? Because they, they are not ready to break up their day, but providing them the variety of spaces necessary to do what they, they need to be successful. So what are the collaboration areas? What needs to be enclosed versus open? Uh, where do people actually get work done if they need to be doing it in the office? How do customers or visitors flow through your space? So asking those critical questions can help you think about what that future space might look like. Yeah, and I, I do think, you know, the office space, even more so now, you know, we already talked about this tool for recruiting and retaining staff but it's gotta be engaging. So the design I think is gonna be even more critical now. It's gotta be a destination that people are gonna to wanna to go to, to be able to connect and collaborate. So I think, you know, from a design standpoint, I'm excited about that. You know, it gives me opportunities to really think a little bit more outside of the box on how office space should be designed and what are some of the amenities that staff look for and the functions as Kelly mentioned that staff look for when they come into the office space. With that, there also is a few other things, Roger, just tying in the whole, as we go into the future office, we're also tying in some of the technology side as we go into free, the whole free address side of it, and we're opening it up that you can come in and you can sign in for this desk for, for the day and take it. And going through software like Team or Robin or different software that we can have for scheduling software, what we're finding is that people are signing out a desk for a day and then at the end of the day, it gets cleaned and it's brought back to a clean state for the next person that arrives the next morning. So from a functional perspective, we've cut down on it. But as we take the, um, the software and it gets to a point where we've put an iPad at the end of a bank of desks and they can sign into that desk when they come there. There's a lot of new software out there, but then there's a lot of ways for us to take that and actually implement it into um, items like we had talked about before, about like a digital twin, different areas where we can actually take that software and you now know what spaces you're putting in are actually being used the most. What's, what's actually productive? What is good space? And that's where persons like the clearing in that can take that data and they can bring it together and we can help with designing you into the, the right space when you do your next uh, position, your next office. You're not always just designing to, this is what I've always done. You're designing to what's actually being used and what's actually current that the staff want. Agreed. Randy, so we actually, it's funny that you mentioned hot desking or hoteling. We have a lot of different terms for that, um, that uh, touchdown space. So thinking about, you know, um, we had talked about earlier, there's a low percentage of people spending time at their desk that we've noticed through observation studies. Um, and, you know, we all have a role in, you know, our, how many personal items we have in the office space and things like that. So in terms of navigating how to assign assigned space as versus um, hoteling or unassigned space. Are there any recommendations you all have around determining what, what and who gets assigned as versus who is unassigned? I think it's a, it's a very good question. There's, it really depends on the organization. We've got one organization right now that we're working with and everybody, even including the CEO, is unassigned 
and they have about 4,000 staff. So they're, everyone is in a point where they can book. It may be sectionalized off that these staff are persons that would only need a, um, a workspace type assigned and they can assign where they need to, or these people are somebody who definitely need a physical office, um, like your HR staff and stuff for records. But it really comes down to the organization and how each person in senior leadership is to being open to that point of hoteling. The reason I use the free address word is a lot of people that we've worked with look at hoteling where we used to have it, where everyone had a fixed address. And those people who only came into the office once or twice could stop down in a hoteling bank. It was this specific uh, kind of under um, utilized space that they've created into hoteling. Now what we're finding is that people are taking it and putting it into all different types of space, but they're opening it up to multiple staff. Yeah, I, I, to add to that, I think, um, you know, there it is definitely dependent on the organization, no doubt. Um, and and it, it does have to be somewhat oriented towards the activity the individual does. I mean, there are some roles, responsibilities that obviously need dedicated type space, HR, for example, finance type positions, administrative type positions. Um, you know, there's, there's confidentiality aspects of it. There's storage aspects of it as far as paper. That all falls in line with it. Um, you know, interesting thing, I'm working with a couple organizations, uh, both between about 100 and 300 staff, and it seems to fall right around the one-third, two-thirds line. Um, right now, they're looking at about a third of the staff that are currently in offices would retain dedicated offices, and two-thirds would go to more of a sharing type scenario. Now, they are looking at a pretty um, you know, extensive or robust type of work from home policy where they're planning on people staying home and working and then kind of instilling this, this hub mentality for the office space. But they noticed that, you know, at least a third of the staff really needs to have a, a dedicated home um, so that they can store all the things that are associated with the position and the work that they do. And I would just add um, to this point of how you decide, it's it's what you really need to consider is what is the culture you're trying to have in this physical and virtual environment right so what are you trying to achieve in your culture in your organization uh, and how does your space support that so if it is that you want to have a more collaborative environment it's really important not to put people in dedicated spaces or in enclosed spaces, having people change it up so they're sitting next to others encourages that innovation and creativity um, that people don't get by sitting next to the same person every day. Um, I come into the office and choose my workstation based on what I have doing going on that day. I may not want a typical sit down at the desk uh, area if I have a lot of meetings. I just need a touchdown space where I can keep my bag and my computer and I can run back and forth and I can charge things in between meetings, right? Or I might just have a 30 minute break where I can answer emails. So it's really about thinking about how you're enabling the culture and your mission in the space, not just about who, who needs a dedicated space or wants a dedicated space. So really answering that question first will help you understand and figure out what how much you should have assigned versus unassigned spaces yeah choice is a really critical thing when it comes to office space and i think that's a direction that office space was going in before this all happened again we've just sort of accelerated this now so that you know really people need to be able to set their own settings when they are in the office thank you guys um, we received a question around footprint so um eric i think if you could kick us off with this uh, response, uh, someone asked, how will this impact the demand on the commercial real estate market? Thinking about how um, the different impacts on availability and costs. Could you speak a little to that? Yeah, and I think tie that to with uh, what Roger just said. Ultimately, what this, what the new way of working will do is reduce the amount of space tenants lease, whether it's 10%, 30% or 20%, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the footprints are gonna be reduced. And by the way, that trend 
has been occurring for 10, 12 years. We've been reducing the square foot per occupant ratio for 10 to 12 years, consistently going down. Um, and that's showing up in demand. So for, I'll, I'll just talk about DC as an example, but it, it goes to all the, the metropolitan area. We have two things going on right now, and this is how it impacts the market. One, while there is robust demand, it's demand because it's opportunistic. The land, we have an oversupply of office space. We were at 15% vacant in DC at the end of the year, which was a historic high, higher than 2009 and 2010. So you have all this supply flooding the market at the same time that tenants are getting much more um, uh, consolidating their space. It's getting smaller. So the amount of space that tenants are leasing has gone down for years consistently because we're shrinking the amount of space each tenant is taking. So supply going up, demand going down just because of the redesign. Forget about the economic fallout of what's just happened over the last 90 days. So the markets for tenants are only gonna get better and better for the foreseeable future. Two, the next two to four years, this is gonna to continue to be a tenants market. Right now, everything is sort of locked up. If you can do a deal now, you're in great shape because landlords want this to secure leases. But in fact, by waiting, tenants should actually get a, a even bigger um, lever and better terms. May not show up necessarily on the asking or, or the, the ultimate rental rate, but all of the things behind it, whether it's concessions and also flexibility, very, it's key, and this is important. How do you make a long-term 10, 15 year lease decision when everything right now is opaque? We don't know where the economy is going. We don't know how safe, how long we're gonna be working from home. So it's really key to not only tie financial incentives, but non-financial, which would be lease flexibility, options to terminate, possibly con contraction options, things like that, or even COVID or, or pandemic related rent deferment if another uh, work from home situation occurs in the next 10 years. So these we'll call these non-financial, but really important concessions that tenants should be negotiating going forward. And they will because of this way over supply of space. That's only gonna exacerbate because of the, lo the lessening in demand. So that was a long way of saying, it's gonna be a great market for tenants. <laughs> great, thank you so much for that, Eric. We received another question in talking about construction costs. Um, what impact has this had on the construction project costs and what effect will this have on overall project schedule? Randy, would you be able to speak to that? Yeah, sure. Project costs and schedules have been impacted in the recent months due to the interruptions that have come in with the supply chain and what's happened with the whole of COVID. With supply chains being affected, there has been a greater need to track resource allocations and the lead times of many more products than the standard lead items. With a greater level of schedule and tracking of the project team, this will identify schedule delays, thus enabling the team to address resource deficiencies and or find alternatives um, to the long lead items or what's being delayed in the project. In the short term, there has been an increase in the cost due to having, due to the point of having to um, make kind of in the moment decisions during the pandemic. But for future costs of projects, there will be a leveling out of the overall project costs we even see some of it coming down in certain areas and certain regions, but this will really become the necessary to have an implementation 
of greater project controls into managing the finances kind of moving forward. But kind of the short answer is yes, we're seeing it rise slightly right now, but we will see it come down sort of in the long term. Great, thank you, Randy. I think we'll have time for one more question. Um, so folks are wondering, how can organizations keep the social and networking aspects alive in this virtual environment while we're still here? Um, we received, you know, a couple questions around like, how do we maintain that balance? You know, what can we do there? So um, Kelly, would you be able to share your thoughts around how we might keep that interaction alive um, in this current moment? Yeah, so I think in the current moment of this maximum telework posture, the biggest thing is to encourage people to stay connected, find ways for um, employees to have those chance interactions that they may, that they're not getting with, that they used to get in the office. You're not running into each other at the elevator banks or in the break room, right? So what are those ways that you can encourage that more social interaction? A few things that uh, I've seen or that we've implemented have been things like making it fun, find ways to make your meetings, whether they're themed or closing on a dance party or, or creating check-in, check-out questions that allow people to share their state of mind or what's going on with them or what, what are they doing to stay sane when they're kind of quarantined in their home. Um, other pieces that we're seeing is finding the time for social interaction. Our company, for example, has a weekly get together that we call build relationships every week um, and that used to be going out somewhere near the office being together having that social interaction and we immediately pivoted to doing that online it's a chance for us to interact in a way that's not super related to the work we can keep those connections that we have we also have implemented kind of a coffee roulette where we have a system that anybody who signs up um, they get assigned a random partner every week and you find 30 minutes, an hour, whatever you want to, to have a connection with someone that you may not be interacting with on a daily basis. So those are some ways in the more virtual environment to stay connected as we start thinking about the physical environment versus that virtual environment. It's really thinking about what is, what is necessary to get out of uh, the conversation, the meeting, the interaction that you're trying to have, and what's it, what's going to enable that. Sometimes it might be better to do it virtually because you can be in the same document at the same time making edits, which you can't do as much in the office or face-to-face -face when you're projecting it on a screen and you're pointing to words that you want to change. Um, but there might be times where I really do prefer this to be in person because I want to see how people interact with each other. I want the pe people to build this team and more relationships and have more social interactions. So it's really making that determination of what is the pr preference for that particular interaction and making it clear to people that this is a, a preferred in-person meeting versus a virtual meeting so that people understand how they should be organizing their time. Great. Thanks, Kelly. And being mindful to time, I'm going to pivot back to you so you can close us out. Great. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate your engagement and the questions you all submitted as part of our conversation today. Um, as, and hopefully we can continue this conversation and to think about long term about our space behaviors and key shifts we need to make uh, to make our future spaces work. Um, we will send out uh, materials from this session uh, to help you map out your next steps. You're also welcome to reach out to any or all of our panelists. I've included their email addresses on the screen right now. Um, we'll also send a follow-up email uh, in the next day or two that includes some materials, but also um, a link to this recording that you can um, peruse or share with your um, colleagues. But also we plan to follow up on any questions we weren't able to answer today. Um, we'll send that out as well. So thank you so much everyone for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.